The black ether becomes the solvent, the universal solvent for the state that we are in. It is literally the medicine that opens the door into a direct apprehension of Ensof, which is the goal of all mysticism. Salutations, listeners, and welcome back to Glitch Bottle, the podcast where we uncork the uncommon in magic, mysticism, and the generally misunderstood. I'm Alexander Rath, and today we are very excited to talk about Black Ether with contemplative mystic David Chaim Smith. David's system of contemplative mysticism is radical in that it breaks the emanationistic tendencies that esotericists and practitioners engage in. So instead of approaching reality as a series of complex, dependent correspondencies or spheres emanating from one source, David's Kabbalistic alchemy is radically non-emanationistic. It bathes in the ground of reality itself. And in this podcast, David returns to discuss his latest book called Black Ether, where, as he says, in this style of practice, the perceptual psycho-etheric toxins that obscure reality are sipped like a bee sips nectar from a flower, and the universal solvent called the Black Ether is discovered in the living heart of the most virulent and poisonous clay pot or shells of superficiality that plague the human mind. The secret elixir is extruded through the black ether as each obstruction is purified and ultimately only the pure divinity of Ein Sof remains. Listeners, this is such an incredibly powerful system, and whether you're a magician or an esotericist, I know you'll enjoy these radical ways to explore the approach of reality. And now to help us uncork the uncommon, let's welcome back David Chaim Smith. David Chaim Smith, thank you so much for coming back on the Glitch Bottle podcast today. It's a pleasure as always, Mr. Alex. Love being on your show. Well, Dave, the honor is certainly mine, and I know myself and the listeners truly appreciate your direct experience with contemplative mysticism. And that's what we're talking about today is just the nature of experience itself. And this is reflected in your upcoming tome, Black Ether. So I suppose the most logical question, Dave, is what the heck is Black Ether? I have never heard about this before. Can you share about what this term means? Wow. In order to explain what Black Ether is, Alex, we have to address what the nature of the work itself is going to be and what it is that I'm talking about as an end game for the practice of contemplative mysticism. And contemplative mysticism is generally oriented towards immersing the totality of one's being in the infinite. The infinite, which is called en sof in Hebrew, en means no, sof means end, without end. Ultimately, the immersion of the whole of one's being into en sof is the practice. The entire practice from beginning to end has to do with that immersion. But the mind in its ordinary state is based on a series of habits that block or obstruct or obscure that immersion and actually make it impossible. And the way that that happens is that the mind fixates or grasps on its phenomena in bits, in pieces, in fragmented chunks. And each individual act of grasping, each individual instance of the mind's grasping on phenomena creates a construct that is referred to in Kabbalah as a klipa. Klipa is singular. Klipot or klipas in Yiddish is a plural form of it. But your listeners will probably know this word from the discussion of the klipoth with a TH at the end. That is the word that is commonly used in the literature, although there really is no TH sound in Hebrew. What the klipa is that blocks or obscures or obstructs the mind's immersion into wholeness, into the divine, which is without end, is the idea of 
uh, fixating on that which is finite as opposed to the infinite open expanse, which is available at all times, in all places, through all things to the mind, should it want to investigate it. And this idea of fixating on that which is finite involves the formation of a mental construct called a klipa in which the mind becomes invested. But essentially what a klipa is, is a reified mental construct that posits a kind of a skin <clears throat> around itself so that there is a separation between the construct that is being perceived either internally or externally and the whole of everything else. In other words, it is a bit of reality that becomes cut off from the greater expanse and continuum that surrounds it. So it is both reified into a graspable chunk and divided from everything else. It's very much like a bubble. And this bubble exists in a foam-like expanse of other bubbles. And this is generally how um, this particular view holds the ordinary conventional state of perception that is common to human beings, that there are clusters of bubbles that form relationships. And my main text that I've spoken with you about before called The Fountain of Wisdom, 13th century Kabbalistic text, explains that the common habit field, the conventional habit field is like a foam, a foam which is filled with these bubbles, with these klipas that are individual separately grasped pieces of reality that human beings manufacture, that human beings make. So the basis of this view is that this activity of forming klipas or reified constructs that re and reify and divide each individual instance of reality, moment by moment, substance by substance, place by place, concept by concept, that this actually creates barriers and separation that the mind becomes locked into. And as a result of being locked into this massive bubbling foam that becomes the conventional state where each piece is fragmented and there uh, is an overriding sense of randomness and disjointedness and chaos, essentially taking what is open and continuous, which is the essential nature of Ensof, and making it discontinuous, piece by piece, random bit by random bit. What this does is it utterly cuts off a direct apprehension with the divine. The manufacture of Klepus is essentially the mental habit that locks us in to a meaningless worldview where there is no unifying principle because everything is chopped up into a million pieces. That's essentially the problem. Now, you ask the question, what is black ether? If you somewhat understood that long-winded explanation that I just gave about the mass of Klepus in the foam of the display of reality, then when we look at each individual Klepa, the way that it's constructed has certain parts. There are four main parts that make a klipa. If the klipa is a grasped mental bit that has a skin around it that separates it from the whole of infinity, you could look at that skin, the skin of each perception, of each sense object, of each idea, of each emotion. And we could say that that skin does two things. The skin faces outwardly into the infinite expanse of the unknowable, and we call that the front aspect or the outer aspect of the skin. And by the same token, the underside of that skin faces into the bubble. We call that the inner part of the shell. Klipa essentially just means shell. So if you have that dividing line, the skin of the bubble, there's part of it that faces out, 
and part of it that faces in. And this dichotomy, this dualizing dichotomy between the outer and inner part of each assertion, each assertion of the skin of whatever is perceived, really chops in half, dualizes the assertion of whatever is known into these two aspects. And if you really think about it, this accounts for everything that human beings do with their mind. Anytime a perception is perceived, we think we have perceived something. And what makes a something, what makes a thing itself and nothing else is this reifying and dividing skin-like shell around the experience that we then fixate on and say, aha, I know what this is. It is this. If we can define it, if we can identify it, then we have made a klipa, essentially. Now, getting back to your question, what is black ether? There is this magical, profound, inherently infinite and sublime element that doesn't have to be inserted externally, that you don't have to manufacture out of some great elaborate mechanical process. It's already there. There's this magical quality that is inherent in the skin of reality itself. And it is found at the precise point where the front and back of that skin touch each other. Now, if you think about it, you make a construct, which is like I said, is like a bubble. The front aspect faces out, the back aspect faces in. Where do they touch? Where is that twilight point where these two dualizing elements touch each other? Well, it really can't be located in terms of coordinate points in space or in time. It's not a material place. It's not a place that can be found the way that we find conventional things, because it's not a thing at all. This magical place where front and back touch is the undertone, the twilight of the manufacture of the Kalipa itself. The skins of reality that we think are so definitively real are in question when you consider the ground which is asserted in their expression. And this goes into the view of reality that I hold as a non-emanationist view. The infinite expanse of Ensof isn't relegated to some position that is elsewhere. It is not relegated to an outside position. Where could it be? Where could it go? It has to be inherently whole. Either we believe in a unity, a basic unity of this profound essential nature, or we don't. So if we are understanding intellectually that we seek the medicine for our disease of mediocrity and fragmentation, where do we look for this medicine? We have to look exactly where we are. And if that medicine is the unified nature of Ensof, then it has to be in the deepest, darkest error of our fears and habituations and mistakes, cognitive mistakes. The main mistake is that we think reality is chopped up into infinite pieces and each one is separate from each other one. If that's the central error and unity is true and real, then it has to be inherently expressed in the midst of the mistake. And how much more inherent can you get that the place where a klipa is manufactured? And we know what manufactures a klipa is the place where front and back seem different from each other. And differences can actually be asserted right at that place, which is wherever we stand mentally. That place is known as black ether, the infinite expanse of the ground, ensof, which erases and dissolves the assertion of the klipa itself, because the klipa was never real to begin with. It was an assumption, 
that our mind made about reality, that our habit is that because perception can be perceived, ah, there must be differences. For example, the subject must be utterly and completely separate from the object that it perceives. In other words, perceiving happens, therefore, the identification of that which perceived must be me. So I must be a thing in a world of things called a body mind. And everything else around me functions the same way. It is itself a separate identity. So the world around me, I can assume if I'm operating on the standard, is objectively real. And what I have to contend with, with my own sense of knowing, is the subjectivity of my own mind. So subject and object, subjectivity and objectivity are known through this habit and never the twain shall meet. And this is exactly what makes conventional, ordinary thought function in the random, chaotic fragmented way that it does. So if you take any instance of perception and see the klepa there, where the front and back of that assertion touch, there is waiting for you the ground of all phenomena in its essential state, the purity of Ensof. When it is found, its job is to erase or undermine the mistake that we have made. And the dissolution, the undermining of that mistake is called black ether because it is black to the conceptual mind. It is black in terms of asserting what we call the apophatic state. In other words, the mistake that we have made to orient a world of our own construction, which functions the way that it does in conventional life. This is where the mistake can be unmade. It's where the mistake is made in the first place and the error of reification and division is asserted. So right at that same place where the mistake is made, it can also be unmade. And black ether is the inherent capacity to dissolve fixation on any klepa, wherever it arises, internally, externally, in terms of substance or place or time or concept or feeling, even beingness itself. So black ether cannot be found mechanically, as I've said. It is simply the open fullness of the Oren Sof. And right at that place where a klipa is compounded, and when I say that a klipa is compounded, it is literally the skin of a klipa is a compound made by two assumptions, a contained state inside of it and an uncontainable expanse around it. Now, these are conceptual judgments. These are conceptual designations. We think there is a thing called the expanse of infinite possibility around whatever we perceive, and that's uncontainable. And then we think that something has been contained that we can then grasp at. That is a contained state. Neither one exists without the other, because how could you have a conception of containment unless, it's, uh, unless it can be compared to its opposite, unless it can be compared to the uncontainable? So they're interdependent in relation to each other. And that interdependency compounds in the grasping of the barrier of the skin, and that creates the compound of the reified construct called a klipa that ends up concretizing some aspect of phenomenon, separating it from everything else. And if you think about the fact that human beings do this every moment of every day constantly, then the fountain of wisdom is telling us the truth when it says that Reality, the starting point for an average human being is a cluster of klepas, which appear as relationships of bubbles, creating an endless foam on the surface of an ocean. And we don't know the ocean. The ocean is ensof. All we know is the foam moving around on its surface, sloshing around and, and producing the illusion that it has 
all of these characteristics of mass and volume and place and time. And each individual bit is fragmented and separate from every other bit. Now, the reason why it's so hard to start, start contemplation from this vantage point is because human beings don't have an inherent point of comparison for this, that if all we know is a state of disunity, unity or wholeness becomes a very radical concept. So pursuing it involves unknowing or unlearning everything that we have assumed is real since birth. And that's about the biggest job that a human being can do. So the black ether becomes the solvent, the universal solvent for the state that we are in. It is literally the medicine that opens the door into a direct apprehension of Ensof, which is the goal of all mysticism. And ultimately, the most profound activity that a human being can engage in. To that point, what is the divine spark as it relates to black ether and literally working in this same space of phenomena? Whoa, that is quite a good question, because I said in my explanation earlier on that there were four parts to every Kalipa. There's the skin, which has this front aspect and back aspect. And there is the black ether at the meeting point of those two trajectories, we could say. Now, those are three parts. I didn't address the fourth part. The fourth part goes in to the definition of what a klipa is and what a klipa does. And that is the spark of the Orensof, the spark of the sublime that is concealed by the skin of the klipa. So if we think about it and um, we form in our mind a conception of a klipa like a bubble, the skin of the bubble faces both out and in. Those are two of the parts. Then there's that magical twilight meeting point. That's the third part. So, so far, these three parts that I mentioned are just talking about the skin of a klipa, which is the skin of a perception or the skin of a mental assumption as it makes its constructs. But inside this construct that the skin has produced is an assertion of and so directly. This is referred to as the concealed spark, the nitsots, that is inherent in every bubble. And the theory here is that because the skins produce a kind of a mental density, an opacity that cuts it off from everything else, that we're blind to the presence of these sparks, that we can't see them, we can't access them that they're inherent in all of the appearances of reality, but that inherent nature doesn't do us any good because we, we can't commune with them. So what happens through black ether is that when we realize a view that dissolves the shells, in other words, when we have an orientation that seeks and so no matter what arises, and the black ether inherent in the shell dissolves the making of the shell itself. Then the sparks are spontaneously liberated. In other words, since they were covered up by the shell, if there is no shell anymore, the sparks are free. The, the sparks arise spontaneously in the instance that the shell is undermined. So there's this synergy that goes on between the black ether that unmakes the shell and the liberation of the concealed spark. But let's take this another step further. I already said that black ether can't be designated to any specific place or time or concept or feeling, but is inherent in all of it. Well, that's because the black ether defies the coordinate position of things. The black ether is essentially an assertion of and so. So it's equal everywhere. 
You can't have a bit of black ether here or there, even though it seems like it's discovered bit by bit. The black ether is completely undifferentiated and free. So when it's realized, the seemingly claustrophobic enclosure of the Klippa skin just dissolves because the error is the manufacture of coordinate specifics in places, in times, in substance that chop reality up into the infinite pieces. So the black ether is free. The same is true with the spark. Because if you think about it, if we hold a view of Ensof, that its inherent effulgence, its luminosity, its light, is the assertion or the expression of that which is inherently whole, inherently open, whole, and undifferentiated, then how could you have a piece of it? How could there even be such a thing as sparks in the plural sense? This goes into part of what makes human habituation what it is. Human habituation chops up everything into pieces and isolates those pieces in skins, including the or and so So as black ether is realized and the skin dissolves, the black ether being inherently undifferentiated takes this state of error and fragmentation and returns it to wholeness. Well, the same thing happens with the spark. What we thought of as a piece of divinity that has been separated and enclosed and hidden away in a dungeon as soon as that skin dissolves, we realize that light is light. Light is inherently whole. It's inherently undifferentiated. And there's no such thing as individual sparks. So the, the raising of the sparks from concealment is essentially erasing the idea of the fragmentation of the sparks that we have assumed. We have assumed that, that the divine is chopped up into infinite billions of pieces that are hidden within the fabric of what we think is real. Once we change our conception of what we think is real, we also have to change our orientation towards that sublime luminosity and realize that the sublime luminosity and the liberating, dissolving presence of the black ether, they have to be one in the same. And neither one subscribes to this idea of fragmentation that sparks and the black ether cannot be separated from each other because unity, wholeness is absolute. But the habits of the human mind, which produce a state of fragmentation, are immersed in focusing on and fixating on that which is relative, that which is based on relative habits that always change. So if our view changes from the relative to the absolute, from what constantly changes to what is literally changeless, and the wholeness of the Oren Sof is literally a changeless wholeness, then the unmaking of habit patterns within the human mind and the raising of the essential nature of reality to its original position, which is as everything. This becomes a case-by-case -case study in each individual moment, a way to address what seems to be real through the recognition of its error to spontaneously return that instance of reality to what it truly is. In other words, addressing the klepas, the mental constructs that I'm describing, becomes the path of mystical contemplation. And mystical contemplation is just simply the rehabilitation of a set of habits, errors that the mind falls into to cover over what is always already the case the pure, sublime divinity of the Oren Sof. Can you share a little bit more, David, about how dissolving the mental prison of reification of all phenomena, that it releases this incredible amount of energy that we otherwise were devoting constantly to maintaining 
artificial distinctions. Can you just talk about the energy release? Wow, Mr. Alex, you just read my mind because that was that was something I was just thinking of that I had to throw in there. Yes, um, when the black ether undermines the inner and outer aspects of a klepa and the sparks are spontaneously liberated, obviously there's a tremendous amount of energy, which is really luminosity, divine open expressiveness that the mind can tap into and utilize in contemplation. We essentially know it as life force. So several things happen when we start to undermine the habitual assumptions about the reality that we think we are in. Um, Part of this has to do with tremendous amounts of life force becoming available for the process. Then there is the tremendous amount of life force that has gone in to the act of perception, making it the way that it seems. So two sources, we could say, of life force become available to us that are extraordinary once we start to question the reality of things. One comes from the energy that is released when the prior conceptions are released and set free. In other words, when the shells dissolve, the energy that uh, constituted those those shells becomes available to us. And then a, a tremendous amount of new energy from the influx and the brilliance of the seemingly contained sparks that assert themselves and are raised out of habitual imprisonment, that also becomes available. So we have the, the energy that we're already using in the manufacture of the shells, plus all of this new energy, because we've broken through to a new register uh, of vibratory frequencies so that the resonance or power or vividness and brilliance and clarity and transparency of reality starts to make itself known. In other words, Once you start questioning the dim, dark opacities of human assumptions, the contrary becomes increasingly true. It becomes brighter, clearer, more transparent, more space-like, and that which is perceived becomes more like bright space, and the perceiving of it becomes more like bright space. Ultimately, at the end of this process, that which knows, which we call consciousness, and that which is known, which in Kabbalah we call the contents of the worlds, the various registers in which knowing takes place, they begin to merge with each other into a basic wholeness. And this is very much like the wholeness that is discovered in each klipa as the liberated sparks and the black ether are realized together as one in the same. And the reason why this becomes incredibly profound in terms of the amount of energy that is kicked up by this process is because klipas are never found singularly. Klipas are always found in networks, because if you think about it, when the mind focuses on anything, It does so in a trajectory of association, in an associative cluster. So if you think about a thought, you assume that you're holding one particular thought or perception or feeling or whatever it is. But what you're actually doing is drawing a link in association between that thought and a whole cluster of related thoughts. For example, if you look at your hand, you think that you're looking at a singular object called a hand. The hand is you. The hand is connected to your arm. The hand is very much like other human hands. The hand grasps things. It has five fingers. It's got bones and so on and so forth. So no matter what you find in the habit field, you're opening up pathways to associative clusters that are all activated through relationships. And what's interesting about this is that as the klipas assert these networks of association, 
All of them become viable at the same time, and the mind can go in an infinite number of directions. And this is very similar to what the physicists call superpositioning, that we have simultaneous relational links when we have klepus, and they interpenetrate each other, and they're mutually non-obstructing selectively. In other words, they're selective in their non obstructing assertion according to the relationships that are made. So, for example, let's go back to the example. You look at your hand, then you could think about all the different aspects of the hand that present themselves. And there's so many, and they all interpenetrate each other. And in the moment that you see the hand, you could think about any of them. You could think about some of them. You certainly can't think about all of them, but you think about them in groups, so they're interpenetrating and mutually non obstructing according to relationship. In other words, the clepus within the networks become selectively permeable to each other. And this is how mental relationships are fostered and are made. But, and here is the real kicker of, of mystical contemplation. Black ether is found in any of the skins of any of the clepus in a network, but they, they do not assert, the skins of the clepus do not assert separate aspects of black ether. It's the same black ether. So black ether can't be cut and chopped and relegated to infinite positions. It's inherently free. So, if you discover black ether in any of the clepus, in any of the networks, one drop, one instance, one expression of black ether can erase an entire infinite superpositioned, interpenetrating and mutually not obstructing set of associative clusters that could go on into infinity. So, black ether becomes literally the universal medicine for a disease that seems to stretch out into endlessness. Endless compounded registers of activity can become liberated through the, the discovery of even one moment of black ether, and infinite sparks can be liberated in that act. And since the black ether and the spark are not separate from each other, tremendous amounts of illumination and transparency and clarity can arise spontaneously in the instance that the appearances of reality are freed from their perceptual constraints. So this tremendous liberation of energy, which comes from both the manufacture of the clepus and the liberation of the spark activity, brightens the entire appearance field. Unfortunately, the problem with mystical contemplation is that the breakthroughs that liberate this tremendous volume of energy, these instances have to contend with a counterforce. And that counterforce is the momentum of the energy and the magnetism of the habit field within the Klippo networks that constitute the realms, and in particular, in our case, the human realm. So each breakthrough that realizes the nature of black ether as an illuminating force that outshines the dimming opacities and constraints of reality. Each instance of breakthrough has a tendency to snap back to its prior habituated form because of the momentum that we ourselves are born into. And this is a tremendous struggle within practice because each individual breakthrough is relatively short-lived, that we have moments of insight and tremendous intuition of the free and whole and absolute nature of open luminosity of the or and sof. But by the same token, we're pulled back into the habit field because of the strength of its momentum. Almost as soon as the breakthrough registers, we start to begin to be pulled back into the habit field. And this is why contemplation is not a finite mechanical 
remedy. It is a practice. We immerse in this activity of holding the appearance field as pure and infinite. And we contend with the struggle by making breakthroughs and snapping back into habit and then making new breakthroughs and snapping back into habit again over and over and over until we ourselves build a resolution and a momentum of our own that's applied to our practice. Ultimately, it has to be so strong that it is set against the momentum of the habit field. And if you think about infinite lifetimes of infinite beings in, in realms that are populated by infinite numbers of beings, how strong would that momentum be? And to think that one tiny little dust speck of a person's practice can offset the momentum of everything that we were born into and think that we know, well, that's a tremendous job put on our shoulders and seems seemingly impossible, right? And it is, it is seemingly impossible and incredibly profoundly difficult that what we are struggling against is the tides of an infinite ocean. And we're just this tiny little moment. But having said that, we are contending here with the true nature of reality. And the more we become aware of truth in and of itself, the truth of Ensof. Either we believe it or we don't. And if we believe that Ensof is what it's purported to be, and those of you in your audience, Alex, who practice ceremonial magic or um, some kind of occultism or different forms of esoteric study, most of them, if they're Kabbalistically based, are predicated on Ensof. So chances are a good portion of your audience already has a certain amount of faith in Ensof as the infinite open possibility that expresses itself through its own light. And if this is what we are uncovering as the individual skins of the networks of Klippus in their associative clusters are mitigated and resolved, then the tremendous amount of spark activity and illumination that is kicked up by this process becomes available to us, and it has a momentum of its own. So we join with the momentum of previous generations of practitioners and their gnosis, and our gnosis and its trajectory is cultivated and developed, and its momentum grows exponentially according to how many breakthroughs we can muster through the strength of our own practice. So ultimately, gnosis becomes the remedy for the mediocre and um, meaningless state of ordinary affairs. And the way that this is generally understood in the world of practitioners is as a kind of bliss, a kind of substitute of the mediocrity of the habit field for a bliss field in which each moment of appearance in the networks of associations that offer meaning in the register that it's commonly understood, that meaning changes and becomes a bliss-filled expression of sublime divinity. Now, that has a momentum, as I've said, which is truly beyond what we understand. And in order to tap into that momentum and enter into this bargain of substituting a mediocre reality for a profound and sublime one, we have to unmake, unlearn, abandon, and dissolve all of the habits and forms of perceptual grasping that are automatic to the way that we're used to functioning. And part of that has to do with allowing ourselves to let go and release and forget this thought that we think that we understand things and this thought that we think that we know the world around us and the world inside of us and the knowing itself. And that release constitutes a kind of a blackness. It's black in terms of conceptuality. It's conceptually black. 
This is a way of describing what in mysticism is called the apophatic state, the state of unknowing. And it literally is the, the step off point between the ordinary world that we think is real to whatever level that we do and this range of discovery, spectrum of discovery, which is absolutely infinite and endless and its brilliance and clarity can totally overwhelm the previous assumptions. And once little tastes of it are made available, it literally becomes a bliss field. In other words, the, the, the surge of ecstatic joy that is inherent in the discovery of the register of or and so in so-called ordinary life utterly outshines and outweighs the mediocrity, which because of the language that I'm using, obviously I'm asserting that ordinary reality is not that great. And once you discover ultimate greatness, what do you think is going to happen? Of course, it becomes an act of bliss and becomes utterly overwhelming in its magnitude. It's a bargain and a deal that I can't imagine any interested party rejecting. The question is just whether or not people can believe enough in the precepts that support such an endeavor to actually investigate it. And it involves a certain amount of curiosity, which ordinary people tend to not have. People tend to be not very curious about the reality that they inhabit. And that is just incredibly sad because there is no excuse in the human experience to be bored or to believe at, uh, and take at face value the misery and suffering of, uh, of the infinite horrors of the world. I'm not saying that the infinite horrors of the world go away. They don't. But phenomena itself changes and the meaning of phenomena itself changes. So when the horrors and terrors of the world arise and suffering arises, the practitioner approaches it differently. And that starts to change the way that reality is and mitigates the suffering at its root. And what we're looking for here is solving the issue at root causes and not um, just generating interesting experiences for ourselves. And, and that distinction is another thing that we could talk about maybe at another time. There's so many amazing things about the way that you approach contemplative mysticism, Dave. And one of those is this just incredibly redemptive quality in your work as well. And some systems of mysticism might use this, I am not this, I am not that method that applies to phenomena until they arrive at some realization. But what I really appreciate about this, and I just love for you to share more about it, is your system embraces phenomena. It embraces experience, whatever arises, and it, it finds divinity, it finds redemption right there. Yeah, Alex, the uh, basis of what I'm saying is that we're not running away from anything. You know, we're not running away from the horrors of the world. Like I said, we're not running away from our fears and anxieties. We're actually running towards them because they are phenomena. And if you are interested in this um, stance of unicity, you know, realizing the wholeness of the ground of of the or and so inherent in all the packages and forms that it's presented as, you've got to run towards all of it equally. You can't pick and choose because it's the picking and choosing that, that, that thrusts it back into conceptual activity of an ordinary kind where I like this part of it and I don't like this other part of it. So as a result of this, the contemplative mystic becomes a kind of a crazy person because if you take what I'm talking about to its extreme, <clears throat> you don't seek pleasure and avoid pain in the same way that an ordinary person would. And we got to go into a little bit deeper understanding of what this activity actually consists of, because I don't want people to get the wrong idea when I say that this is not an escapist 
system, but yet we cultivate bliss, people will think, yeah, well, give me some of that. Give me more bliss. But that is a trap in and of itself. And that's not the kind of bliss that I'm talking about. Bliss experiences become like drug experiences. They're, they're temporary and they're, they're yet more phenomena to fixate on. So what would prevent us from just taking our bliss and making another Kalipa out of that? That's not what I'm talking about at all. The kind of spontaneous bliss that arises is the inherent nature of reality interfacing with our consciousness. This is just what happens when discoveries are made. If we seek it out and grasp it, we literally ruin it. So let's go back to what makes a klipa. Like I said, it's a compound. It's a compound between a seemingly contained state and a seemingly un containable expanse around that so-called contained state. And as I've also said that these Klippa constructs, these compounds exist in networks of clusters that are superpositioned and they're interpenetrating and mutually non-obstructing selectively according to relationship. All right. If you understood that amount of information, then we could talk about the application of it. There's two ways that it a mind approaches klipas in their networks. And one is generally, and the other is specifically. Generally, we could say that the clusters of associative activities are guidelines for how the entire realm functions collectively and how experiences are shared from mind to mind. There are certain things that you and I can agree upon. For example, uh, the sky is up above us and the earth is down below our feet. Physical objects seem stationary until they're moved by forces that have a, a tendency to carry them according to paths of motion. Whatever kind of configuration of the laws of physics you want to come up with that we could agree upon that all human beings generally in the realm can agree upon. These would be the shared guidelines of our collective experience. It's called the general compound or the general state of phenomena. But within that, there's a specific unique component to phenomena that is unique individually to each mind. So when you look up at the sky and say the sky is up there and it's an infinite expanse and it contains clouds and sunlight comes from the sun, et cetera, et cetera, your experience of that will be slightly or greatly different than the experience of another being that has that same shared basic general understanding. So on a general level, we could say the broad strokes meet up with each other, but specifically, you can't even talk about how your sky is different from my sky. You can't even find words to differentiate why mine is different from yours, because the thing about it that is different is, is so subtle that it's incomprehensible, and language can't get that specific. If you look up at the sky and say it's blue, and I look up at the sky and say it's blue, and we both agree that it's blue in this general realm of phenomena, how do you know that your blue is the same as my blue? And if it's not, how can we talk about the distinctions and match them up or compare and contrast them? We can't. So on the general level, we could undermine Klippa networks that are very coarse, but the way that they are accessed is backwards from the common one. The common way of looking at reality is that we assume that the general comes first and is objectively true. And inside of that are these aberrations of specific moments that we almost, almost completely ignore. So the general 
uh, becomes way more important for ordinary reality. That's what physicists are looking at. And that's what uh, reductionists and materialists and nihilists think is objectively true about reality because they can't really get at the specifics that are unique to each individual mind. What a contemplative mystic does is goes through the totally intangible, specific nature of experience, which is so profoundly subtle that only that level of subtlety can break through a klipa and find the black ether. The root of each klipa shell where reification is either made or unmade is the same root for all of the klipas in the general klipa field, but it is found uniquely and specifically. And this is what makes contemplation profoundly private an individual affair that can't be shared with anybody else. But once the connections and breakthroughs are made specifically and uniquely to each mind, the whole general realm starts to change its meaning. But you can't convince a materialist of this because you can't change their reality. You can't even tell them about your own contemplative experiences so that they will understand it. They would have to be sharing the same view that you do in order to even have that conversation. Kabbalistically, the point of black ether, where both general and specific aspects of shells dissolve and sparks are liberated, this is the Keter aspect of each shell. And at Keter, a certain assumption is either made or unmade. Conventionally, this assumption is that reality either is or isn't. And this dichotomy between is and is not, between something and nothingness, this is the primary dualizing root that allows reification and division to persist. In Kabbalah, this goes back to the, the passage in the Bible where Moses stood in front of the burning bush and he said to God, uh, who should I say sent me? And God says, eh, yeah, asha, eh, yeah. I will be that which I will be. So the assertion is made that we call I am. That assumption is the point at which an I am, a tangible beingness, the isness of reality, is either reified or unmade. In other words, when you assert I am, that point of assumption separates the I am from I am not. And this is the essential dualism that is undermined when you reverse the the giant klipa, the root klipa of all klipas that is either made or unmade at Keter. Because from the point of view of the way that I'm speaking about it, the assertion of Echia, Asher, Echia, I will be that which I will be, on an exoteric level, turns the God of the Bible into just a giant ego that says, I am, separating that I amness from whatever it's not. And if the I am is the whole of things, then we've got a wholeness that is then reified into a giant monad. And we know that Kabbalah is not supporting that view. So it's kind of a trick. That the, that the I am assumption gives us, where we either make or unmake this, this I am tendency, which is the tendency to create a, a klipa skin. And in the case of God at the burning bush, that skin encompasses everything, all worlds, all souls, all variation, both general and specific. So I am most definitely going against the exoteric association of a a living God as a being here. And I am taking the the metaphor that is given in the Bible as a point of departure in which we could abandon the I am and dissolve the I am, not into nothingness, but beyond the separation between being and nothingness to concentrate on reality as neither option, neither is, nor that which is not. 
And beyond that point of distinction, we only have an apophatic level of understanding. If we unmake the mind's options to either accept or reject ontological or epistemological states, well, what's left? Well, in terms of philosophy, there are no other options. So we're going beyond philosophy here at the root where we take the step off point apophatically into the unmaking of phenomena. Many listeners are familiar with the Kabbalistic tree of life and the Sephirot and the spheres, but what else is going on here Kabbalistically as it specifically relates to dissolving habit fields and directly bathing in this redemptive reality of Ein Sof? Thank you once again for asking that question, Mr. Alex. That's a damn good question. Like I said, the black ether is found in the Keter aspect of each instance of reification. That's the apex point of the making of a shell that purports to be some kind of finite phenomena. So if we're looking for the infinite in the finite, we can only find it at the highest possible point. We can only find it at its crown, we could say. So in order to reach that point where we rise to the occasion to challenge reality as it is presented, we have to take a tremendous amount of life force from the way that we process things and concentrate it. And the way this is done Kabbalistically is through raising what we think is the energy of Malkut throughout three triads, the triad of Nehi, Netzach, Hod, and Yesod. And then that rises to the triad of Chagat, which is uh, Chesed, Gevorah, Tferet. And then that whole composite, which then incorporates the whole of the lower seven spherot of the tree, rises to the point of Dat, where it can then access Chokmah and Bina and that particular triad. So those are nine spherot that are galvanized or coalesce at dot in order for that the sum total of the life force of all of those qualities and attributes Kabbalistically to be thrust into the apex of the crown, which is Keter. So let me just restate what I just said. Through the raising of Malkut, three triads are concentrated at dot and prepare themselves to enter into this sacrifice where they give over their life force to the master Klippa, which is that I am principle, which is unmade at Keter. And Keter is described in the Fountain of Wisdom as a door that opens and closes. When the door is closed, all you have is reifications in the rest of the spherot. But when that door is open, Keter essentially opens the way to Ensof. So in order to approach that door, everything has to concentrate at a point of surrender, and that point is dot. But dot is referred to as a false head, because dot literally means knowledge. And for conventionally minded people, what we're really talking about with the kind of knowledge that is cultivated there is conceptual knowledge. So the sum total of the lower nine spherot in an ordinary sense is like a false head on a body or a, a head that, that has deficiencies that it realizes can be corrected by surrendering over to the true head, which is Keter. But since Keter is just a venue for the expression of or and sof and is not an endpoint in and of itself, just as Dot was called a false head, Keter is called a headless head. It's not a head in the sense of it really being the definitive endpoint. It's not the endpoint. It's really just the beginning of something which is uh, utterly open and infinite. So it functions as a head, but it's a head of headlessness, you could say. So when the lower nine sphere wrote coalesce at dot at the false head of dot and surrender to the headless head of Keter, dot essentially opens what we call the apophatic bath. And the apophatic bath 
is the endless unknowing and unmaking of all the clip of skins and all the superimposed networks that are infinitely interpenetrating and mutually non-obstructing throughout all the worlds, all the levels of consciousness that are possible throughout phenomena. And at Keter, that master klipa, which wants to assert I am through the influx of the tremendous amount of life force that is raised to the point of dot and surrenders itself over to Keter like a giant beast that incorporates the wholeness of everything. The sacrifice of that beast will allow the, the outcome of blessing force to break free, free from containment. <clears throat> but the interesting thing about this metaphor is if you're, if you're looking at all the phenomena as a giant beast that is placed on the fires of sacrifice, <clears throat> the fires of sacrifice themselves would have to be part of the beast because it's everything, right? There's nothing outside of it. So what could cook it? So essentially, when the beast lays itself on the fire of sacrifice at dot, the beast has to consume itself in its own fire. The sum total of its own life force is the only thing. Cooking reality from the inside out is the only way to surrender the false head to the headless head of Keter. And that opens up everything that we know and everything that we think is real into the mystery of unknowing. That's the apophatic bath that I refer to. And that is literally the step-off point into profound mysticism, not by accumulating more knowledge or data or information, but by surrendering the sum total of everything that we think is true. Now, what happens when the black ether is approached with sufficient life force, the surrender of sufficient life force that is sufficient to um, recognize and tap into the unmaking of the shell, uh, sufficient for the black ether to dissolve the reification of the shell. At that point, we have to look into Kabbalistically what the shell was made of. The metaphor for consciousness, the fluidity of consciousness that um, is used in alchemy is the aspect of mercury and the aspect of life force that melts the calcified frozen structures of that mercury is called sulfur. So what happens in habit, human habituation, is that when the mercury freezes up to produce a klepa, freezes up to produce a shell, the mercury becomes a kind of a salt. And the shells, literally the clepas, are called mercury salts. And when life force is raised to the point that those mercury salts can be challenged, we have sulfur amplified to such a fever pitch in contemplation that it could begin to melt the mercury salts to convert the salt frozen state of mercury back into its fluid form. And this is what happens with view and effort and life force that is raised devotionally and through the fire of contemplation. But <laughs> here's the point where we have to <clears throat> throw in a warning. As we know from the physical analog, mercury is toxic. So as the mercury salts melt, Toxins fly. It's not that they are coming from a place where they weren't already there. They're, the toxic nature of mercury was already inherent in the frozen shells of the clepus. However, once we play around with them and challenge them and melt them, the innate toxicity of mercury, which is antagonistic to the mind's equilibrium and status quo, we can start to feel really, really bad. So in order to get to the bliss of contemplation, you have to break through successive layers of antagonism because your habits are being antagonized. And a tremendous challenge, a tremendous death has to occur where the unexpected hidden mysteries of reality will irritate you and it will be painful. This transition is painful. But ultimately, even that pain 
asserts itself in the same way that every klipa does. It poses a skin and then you find the black ether in that skin and you raise the sparks out of that skin. So as finer and finer levels of discovery open up and the mercury starts to flow freely from the melted mercury salts from the raising of life force, if you reach that root of Keter, where the headless head allows this outpouring of possibilities, great fantastic levels of transmutation become possible. And ultimately, the life force that has been raised and the melted mercury can form amalgams. And those amalgams exist at a point that we call the heart. And that's where the philosopher's stone is crystallized and cultivated. That's an entirely different discussion, maybe for another time. So a great deal of the Kabbalistic technical information that you asked about that's appropriate for this conversation really has to do with the raising of life force, the entry into the apophatic bath, and the melting of the mercury salts. In your system, Dave, you use your own language. How does this allow you to concentrate on meaning alone and totally eliminate cultural artifact fixations? Well, all meaning it comes down to one understanding, and that understanding is the ground of phenomena. So, no matter what kind of meaning we break through into to apprehend, no matter what kind of meaning comes out of our work, ultimately, all meaning comes from the same place. It comes from the innate, essential nature of phenomena, which is en sof. So that's really the only meaning that we have to reconcile, the meaning of the or and sof, the meaning of the ground. And the way that that is reconciled using the language that I use is in a non-emanationist manner. And we've spoken about this many times, but it comes down to a very simple understanding that en sof is inherently open. It is essentially a no thingness, a nothingness. There is no substance at no place, at no time, without concept, without even being or non being. It is completely free. But at the same time, the fullness of this openness, nothingness is absolute. It's every aspect of possibility that is possible. It's infinite possibility, an absolute fullness of possibility. We generally use the term plenum when we're addressing the fullness of openness, nothingness. And the fullness of openness, nothingness is exuded spontaneously and expressed as what we call luminosity. Luminosity doesn't mean the visible spectrum of light or even sound or any kind of phenomena. The term luminosity just means spontaneous, clear, possibilizing expression. So it's the possibilizing capacity of the openness, nothingness that becomes what we call bright. And brightness here is a metaphor for what awareness does. Awareness is inherently bright. The brightness of awareness is its a wearing quality, if you want to use a term like that. So the reason why I view meaning differently than others in this non-emanationist sense is because unlike other forms of Kabbalah, I don't see that the openness, nothingness of Ensof has produced or created a light that is separate from itself. In other words, the common misconception is that Ensof emanates its light, steps down or reduces itself or diminishes itself to produce its ore, its light. And then that light then further reduces itself and steps down to produce the worlds of Atsilut and Bria, Yetzira, Seya, and so on and so forth throughout all the worlds and all the levels of the soul, each one being a step-down position on a kind of a hierarchical ladder. That's the common emanationist view of meaning, that Ensof is absolute meaning, and from that are all the lesser levels of meaning in descending order. What I'm saying is radically not that. 
What I'm saying is that the spontaneous possibilizing expression of the openness nothingness is the same as the openness itself. In other words, and SOF is inherently open, its light is inherently open, which makes and SOF inherently luminous. So the luminosity is open and the openness is luminous. In other words, the fullness of absolute possibility and the possibilizing capacity of its expression cannot be divided from each other. One did not come from the other and so did not produce anything. In essence, nothing has ever been created ever. In other words, the divine didn't spit out this thing called light that then got fashioned into an infinite network of worlds. All there is, is the inherently luminous openness, nothingness, which is the essential meaning of all things. Once you take away the clepus of our understanding. So mitigating the clepus through black ether is a return to this absolute expression of meaning, which is, a luminous plenum of total fullness of possibility. And either you believe in the unicity and the wholeness of that sublime conditionless condition, or you don't. And if you are, for example, a nihilist materialist, and you believe that the appearances of the world, the way that they seem superficially is all that there is, you're not going to accept this view. If you're an idealist who believes that only, like Plato said, that only the um, hidden objects that produce the shadows on the walls of the cave, that the objects are real and separate from each other, you might not accept a view of total openness, wholeness whatsoever. Um, whether Plato did or didn't accept that was debated in the works of Plotinus. And that's an open question for, for minds much greater than mine. But if you are an esotericist or an occultist and you believe in an emanationist system that steps down light in a hierarchy, you still might not accept the unicity of uh, the openness plenum of the ground as the subliming agent of phenomena, the universal subliming agent of phenomena. And if you don't accept that, you cannot approach Klepus through the black ether in order to unmake the lesser constricted meanings of conceptual fixation for a Gnostic openness. I know I'm throwing in a lot of crazy big words for people and people are going to get lost but the pith of what I'm saying is actually not really that complex. It's not really that difficult to intellectually understand what I'm saying. It's just hard to get there. But once you get there, the understanding is pretty simple. I think if you could follow a subway map of New York City, then you can understand everything that I'm saying if you study it enough. Given all of this, given the big picture messages and meanings that you're sharing with listeners right now about black ether and about engaging with reality in a completely different way. Does black ether, your book give readers the tools to begin their own contemplative mystical practice to apply what you're saying? Can you share more about the content of the book? I think it comes down to whether or not people care about the main message that I'm offering because you could very easily get lost in words that you never heard before and symbols being used in odd ways and lose the forest for the trees, so to speak. If you care about the mess of meaninglessness and fragmentation and randomness of ordinary perception, if you see the status quo of how human minds work as needing of revision as insufficient for the inherent joy of being alive, then you're going to have this natural tendency to question the superficial way that things appear both around you and in your own mind. If you have that kind of curiosity, if you actually care about this issue 
of finding some basic open state of wholeness in things the way that they appear, not separate, not a, not as an escapist fantasy of going to some other place where everything is perfect, but right in the place where you stand. If you think to yourself, this couldn't possibly be all that there is. If you have that kind of attitude, then my system is just one way to enter into an ever deepening way of creating breakthroughs for yourself. It's not the only one. It's not even the best one. It's just the one that I'm offering. The most important thing is that people honor their basic impulse to question the status quo of reality and seek something that breaks through and goes further. Whether it's my work or the work of Kashmir Shaivism or Vajrayana or Christian mysticism or Sufism, whatever it is, you just really have to take the spiritual technology as a means to an end. And what allows you to proceed towards that end and the trajectory that heads towards that end is this basic curiosity. I think that it's not something that can be cultivated in a person. I think people are either born with it or they're not. So I think that Contemplative mystics are born and not made because no matter how smart a person is, um, you, can't, you, you can't smart your way into the kind of curiosity that I'm talking about. And you could be brilliant and not have it. And by the same token, you could be not that smart at all and have tremendous amounts of it. And we see this by looking at practitioners, looking at the lives of practitioners, that, that either you're dissatisfied with the status quo and know in the core of your being that there must be more than just the surface level, or you don't care. So, you know, it really comes down to how people approach my work. And if you have that curiosity and you approach my work correctly, it can become a very valid system that produces, you know, great fruits of... Um, of realization. It's, it, it's a system that actually does work for quite a few people, but you have to start out by caring about the question more than anything else in your life. And that's what it comes down to, basically. What else would you like to leave listeners with in addition to what you've just shared? Any other uh, big picture themes or reminders or anything else that you'd like to share? Yeah. Going back to Black Ether, Black Ether dissolving the habitual assumptions of the skins of reality to liberate the sparks of the divine. This is not a mechanical process. This is not something that you could read my book and say, here's step one, step two, step three. Doesn't work that way. There is no mechanical process that's going to work. It's a series of provocations and propositions that have to be considered, and they're considered through symbols. So you read the book, you consider the symbols, you apply that consideration to your life in each moment, and you forge from the sum total of it a practice based on your reality. It's a very, very different way of approaching practice from the usual one, which tends to be very formulaic formulaic in the sense that you do a series of mechanical steps or rituals or actions, and they're causal in nature. And if you do them correctly, you get the result of those causes, which is some kind of specific outcome. My work doesn't function that way. It is non-mechanical in the extreme. The sum total of the symbol field of all the assertions that I'm presenting all come down to the conclusion of what happens with the mind in each moment as it interfaces with reality? That moment, which is always, right? There is never a moment that is not that. That's where the sum total of your practice comes to bear. That's the triangulated tip of the arrow. And that's where the book is cited to do its work. Author, contemplative mystic, esoteric cartographer, his new book coming out in 2022 is Black Ether, 
David Chaim Smith. David, thank you so much as always for taking the time and just sharing your deep experience and deep wisdom on the podcast today. Thank you, Alex. And you know, your audience and this show is the best that there is. I mean, your people in their comments, especially on um, YouTube and other venues like that, very, very insightful. I know I'm in the right place when I'm talking to you because the people that are going to hear it are people who really care. And I, I hope I've given them something to consider today. Listeners and Glitch Bottle patrons, I hope you enjoyed the chat with David Chaim Smith as much as I did because his radical non emanationism, the core of his contemplative mystical system, is so powerful because it challenges so many of the assumptions and the approaches that magicians, ceremonial magicians, grimoiresists, esotericists approach. And this bathing in the heart of reality itself, that no matter what presents itself, whatever painful situation or joyous situation or anything at all, can be illuminated with the scintillating ground of reality because they are one in the same. It's such a powerful system, and I hope that you consider incorporating or exploring parts of that system and definitely check out David's latest home, Black Ether. As always, a huge thanks to each and every Glitch Bottle patron on Patreon for your support. You are the only reason why the podcast continues to grow in new and interesting ways. And if you'd like to jump on the Glitch Bottle caravan and enjoy exclusive perks and chats, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash Glitch Bottle. And as always, you can listen to Glitch Bottle episodes on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Spreaker.com, and Stitcher Radio. As always, this is Alexander F. reminding you to invoke often, uncork the uncommon, and keep the light. Wow.